Grace and peace be to you through God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I would like to welcome all who are present with us on this day, the 10th Sunday after Pentecost. Good morning. Good morning. Let us begin by singing the hymn, Let All Things Now Live In. As we come to you in this time of worship, Lord God, we pray that you may give us a sense of balance between your judgment and your call for accountability and the news of your grace and forgiveness. Help us to recognize that you receive all who come to you with penitential hearts and we ask for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Glory. 
Despite knowing our sin, God chooses to forgive us, seeing our emptiness. God chooses to feed us, holding our shattered hearts. God chooses to heal us. This is the good news. God loves us. God has graced us with mercy and created new life from our brokenness. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let us then bow our heads as we come before the throne of God in a moment and in attitude prayer. Most gracious and loving God, we give you thanks for this day, this new set of opportunities, this day of possibilities put before us. We give you thanks for this time of worship, for the time to be together in community, to be connected to one another in this one purpose. We pray that you may open our hearts this morning. We pray that you may refresh our spirits and renew our inner strength. We pray that you may dedicate us anew to the purposes of your kingdom in this world. We pray that you may help us to make those things a higher priority in our lives, that everything else by extension may fall into place as it should. Help us to further those things that make for healing in this world for all kinds of healing in every way and every facet. We pray for those who suffer brokenness. We pray for those who suffer with them. We pray for caregivers and those in the healing professions. We pray for those who are tired and exasperated in their search for healing and wholeness. We lift up in our prayers those who mourn and grieve any kind of loss and all kind of loss, no matter if the losses are recent or if they've happened in some time in the distant past. We pray for all who wrestle with a sense of loss in their lives and pray that they may find healing in your presence. We lift up in our prayers those concerns which have come to us 
online. Prayers for Dale Byhoffer and Marilyn Rooker. And loving God, we lift up before you in the silence of our hearts those concerns that we can only bring to you there. For the things we've named aloud and for those things which each of us has brought before you in the silence of our hearts, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. singing the hymn, Stand By Me. and also the text for the message today, comes to us from the book of 2 Samuel, chapter 11, verse 26, through chapter 12, verse 13. We'll read all of 13 for the purpose of the message today. When the wife of Uriah heard that her husband was dead, she made lamentation for him. When the morning was over, David sent and brought her to his house, and she became his wife and bore him a son. But the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. And the Lord sent Nathan to David. He came to him and said to him, There were two men in a certain city. The one was rich, the other poor. The rich man had very many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing but one little ewe lamb which he had bought. He brought it up, and it grew up with him and his children. It used to eat of his meager fare and drink from his cup and lie in his bosom, and it was like a daughter to him. Now there came a traveler to the rich man, and he was loath to take one of his own flock or herd to prepare for the wayfarer who had come to him. But he took the poor man's lamb and prepared that for the guest who had come to him. Then David's anger was greatly kindled against the man. He said to Nathan, As the Lord lives, the man who has done this deserves to die. He shall restore the lamb fourfold because he did this thing and because he had no pity. 
Nathan said to David, You are the man. Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, I anointed you king over Israel, and I rescued you from the hand of Saul. I gave you your master's house and your master's wives into your bosom, and gave you the house of Israel and Judah. And if that had been too little, I would have added as much more. Why have you despised the word of the Lord to do what is evil in his sight? You have struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword and have taken his wife to be your wife and have killed him with the sword of the Ammonites. Now therefore the sword shall never depart from your house, for you have despised me and taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. Thus says the Lord, I will raise up trouble against you from within your own house. And I will take your wives before your eyes and give them to your neighbor, and he shall lie with your wives in the sight of the very sun. For you did this in secret, but I will do this thing before all Israel and before the sun. David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. Nathan said to David, Now the Lord has put away your sin. You shall not die. Our epistle lesson comes to us from the letter to the Ephesians, the fourth chapter, verses 1 through 26. I, therefore, the prisoner in the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, making every effort to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in all. But each of us was given grace according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore it is said, when he ascended on high, he made captivity itself captive. He gave gifts to his people. When it says he ascended, what does it mean but that he had also descended into the lower parts of the earth? He who descended is the same one who ascended far above the heavens, so that he might fill all things. The gifts he gave were that some should be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers, to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ until all of us have come to the unity of the faith of the knowledge of the Son of God to maturity, to the measure of the full stature of Christ. We must no longer be children, tossed to and fro and blown about by every wind of doctrine, by people's trickery, by their craftiness and deceitful scheming. But speaking the truth in love, we must grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and knit together by every ligament with which it is equipped, as each part is working properly and promotes the body's growth to the building up of itself in love. Our gospel lesson comes to us from John's gospel, the sixth chapter, verses 24 through 35. So when the crowd saw that neither Jesus nor his disciples were there, they themselves got into the boats and went to Capernaum looking for Jesus. When they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? Jesus answered them, Very truly I tell you, you are looking for me not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. Do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures for eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For it is on him that God the Father has set his seal. When they said to him, What must we do to perform the works of God? Jesus answered them, This is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. So they said to him, 
What sign are you doing to give us then, so that we may see it and believe you? What work are you performing? Our ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Then Jesus said to them, Very truly, I tell you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven but it is my Father he gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is that which comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. They said to him, Sir, give us this bread always. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Thus sends the reading of our scripture. May God add a blessing to our hearing of it. We now continue with special music from the Salem Ensemble. Come thou fount of every blessing. Thank you, Salem Ensemble, for sharing the gift of music with us this morning. I will confess that within the last 15 years or so, I've uh, taken on a renewed interest in in genealogy and family history, not only mine, but also Abby's as well. And it always strikes me that when you study up on things like family history, that history of families, like history of everything else, is not just a series of places and dates, but it's also 
a history of stories and stories that describe what happens to actual real people. And I find that the stories are the interesting thing, the narrative that runs behind all of that. And the thing that I miss was when my dad and his two older sisters would get together and rehash bits of family history. Unfortunately, my dad's older sisters have, have long since passed, and my dad's around to still tell stories, but it was always interesting to listen to the three of them get together and tell stories, because whenever they did that, they would tell the unvarnished stories of family history, the things that made persons of the past come alive with their their strengths, but also their foibles. And I always found the unvarnished stories to be a whole lot more interesting. If I wanted the varnished stories, I knew which persons in the family I could go to to get the gilded history, but when it came to the tidbits that made people seem a little bit more human, I would uh, listen to my dad and his sisters. You know, it's a funny thing, as we talk about family stories and family histories, I think about the way that Hebrew scripture is set up, and we get kind of the same thing in the description of uh, the great figures of the Hebrew Bible. We get the unvarnished stories, not the, uh, the persons in stained glass, but the persons in all of their faults and foibles. Abraham, the father of all who walk and journey in faith, well, you know, Abraham had his moments as well when he was sojourning in the land of Egypt, fearful that the Egyptians might kill him because of it. He passed his wife Sarah off as his sister. Doesn't sound like a terribly courageous thing to do. And Abraham and Sarah's son, Isaac, well, he and his wife, Rebecca, certainly would not be nominees for parent of the year anytime coming soon. They, they played favorites with their children, which is something a good parent should never do. And of course, the next generation down, Jacob, well, Jacob basically negotiated and cheated his older brother Esau out of both the birthright and the blessing that was entitled to him. And so the story goes. We get everybody side of all of those stories, the good and the bad. And alas, today we come to that moment of reckoning with David. Ah, yes, there's a lot of things that uh, people remember fondly about David in Hebrew Scripture. He was the youngest boy in a shepherd family, anointed by Samuel to be king over Israel. He was the one who slew the mighty giant Goliath while still yet a boy. He was able to become sort of a guerrilla refugee hiding from the murderous plots of, of King Saul. He eventually became the unifier of Israel, set up the kingdom in Jerusalem. He was, as Scripture describes him, a man after God's own heart. Those are the good things about David. But today we get the unvarnished truth about David as well, that David was also responsible for one of the most treacherous and heinous acts recorded in Scripture that there were things about his conduct and his behavior that were, were simply reprehensible. And we share that story today, not to knock David down a few pegs, not to engage in gossip, but I think the story exists for us as a, as a tale, as a caution, as a reminder of how easily things can get out of hand and how easily we can distance and separate ourselves from the, from the love of God by the things that we do. And what do we know about David from the story? Well, his fall from grace happened step by step and was simply, uh, you know, was one of those things that could have been avoided very easily. Now, how does the story start off? You back up far enough, and in the spring of the year, we are told, the time when the kings go out to war, 
David, the warrior king, did not go out with his army. Instead, he let others do his fighting. He stayed at home, lounged around in the palace in Jerusalem while others did his dirty work. He kind of shirked his responsibility as ruler and king. And because there was much time on his hands, his his schedule became a little bit lax. It became irregular. The scripture tells us that he was sleeping through midday. And on this particular day, as he was roaming around on the roof of the palace, he caught a glance of a woman who was bathing. And you know, it's not the first glance that gets you, it's the second one that gets you. He locked in, and feelings of lust were kindled in him. And that would have been bad enough, but that led to the next thing. Because he was king and had powerful assets at his disposal, he was able to find out who that young woman was on the adjoining rooftop. And the woman was not a stranger to him, certainly. He found out that the woman was Bathsheba, the wife of Uriah the Hittite, one of his soldiers. And here's a little bit more of the backdrop story. Bathsheba's grandfather was one of David's trusty advisors. Bathsheba's father was one of David's most loyal soldiers. Bathsheba's husband was currently serving in his army. I am certain that Bathsheba was somebody that David had known ever since she was yay high. Not only did he know that, not only did he have a previous knowledge and relationship with her, but he decided to exploit that. And abusing the power that he had, the ability to literally command anybody to do anything at any time, he summons her to the palace abuses that relationship of trust, that imbalance, that great imbalance of power, and he seduces her. And then shortly after that, word gets back to David from Bathsheba that she is conceived, that she is pregnant. And now David has a problem on his hands. Well, David in all his cleverness Decides not to repent, decides not to go uh, to Nathan with his problem, but he figures he's got plan A figured out. He is going to summon Uriah from the front of the battle and have him come to visit his home, making it plausible that he indeed could be the father of this child that is conceived. But the problem is Uriah the Hittite, the foreigner, is a much better observant Jew than David is. He tries to get Uriah to come to his home and enjoy the pleasures of his house, but Uriah said, you know, as you live and as the Lord God lives, I will not do that while my mates are out in the field camping. You know, the motto back in those days, if you were a soldier in the army of Israel, is make war, not love. They had to keep themselves dedicated to that purpose. David plies him with alcohol, he just simply passes out on a couch in the palace. David tries a second night to get Uriah to go back, but he will not. And David realizes that plan A is not going to work. So then David hatches plan B, which is even more heinous and treacherous. He writes a note which Uriah needs to bring to the forefront of the battle that when the battle is situated. Uriah needs to be placed at the front of it, and then soldiers are to fall back, exposing him so that he would certainly die in the heat of the battle. And that message goes to Joab, David's general. And of all the things that David has done, this has to be the most cold, heartless thing. He sent Uriah back to the front with his death orders. Can't think of anything more brutal than that. And lo and behold, the plan B works. Uriah is killed. Bathsheba becomes a widow. David is free now to marry her. And nobody except for David and Bathsheba and possibly Joab 
are any the wiser for it. David's gotten away with it. But unfortunately, what David hasn't reckoned is that God has noticed what he has done. And as we find out in the last verse of chapter 11, the thing that David did had displeased the Lord. And so God sent the prophet Nathan to visit David. And Nathan tells David a story, wants David's take on a, on a judgment. That in a certain city, there were two men, one very rich, one very poor. The rich man had all kinds of herds and flocks. The poor man had but one ewe lamb, who the family embraced almost as a member of the family. It ate and drank with them and slept in his bosom. A wayfarer, a stranger, came to the rich man, and the rich man, instead of wanting to take one of his own of this fold for the purposes of feeding the wayfarer, takes instead the small ewe lamb of the poor man and serves it for dinner. The story angers David, and he says, this man deserves to die. He should restore what was taken fourfold. David is unaware that the trap has been set, that the judgment has been pronounced by his own lips. And Nathan says simply, you are the man. And God's judgment is not pretty in this particular case. That's the second thing we learn about David. Judgment comes even for somebody beloved and blessed as much as David has been blessed by God. Judgment comes, and it is not pretty. Nathan tells David that because of his treachery, heartbreak and violence will be a part of his family life, part of his kingdom's life for as long as he lives. The treachery that David did in secret, others will do against David in broad daylight. And the child that has been born to David and Bathsheba will die. A terrible loss for any parent, but certainly a, a doubly crushing blow for any monarch to lose a potential heir and successor to the throne. David did not get off lightly here. He serves a punishment for the rest of his days because of what he did to flaunt his position of authority and disobey the word of God. Judgment has come, and there is no escaping the consequences of what has happened. He's not been spared that, not at all. Judgment came even for David, and it came hard because David was somebody who was after God's own heart, and he sinned in the most heinous way. But that's not the final word. David acknowledges, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan tells him, you shall not die. David's reign as king would continue, would be troubled. He would pay the penalty for his treachery, but it would continue. And it would continue after him. The next son born to David and Bathsheba would continue in a line that wouldn't end. That, that son would be Solomon. And David would still continue to experience God's blessings in other ways. He confessed his sin he experienced the pardon of God, and as Scripture says, God put the sin behind him. David was able to continue. Now, interestingly enough, the psalm for the day, Psalm 51, if you read the, the prefatory words in front of it, it is a psalm attributed to David, spoken on the occasion of Nathan's pronouncement against him on the situation of Bathsheba. And of course, a lot of well-known verses come out of that, that psalm of repentance, including one that we've sung in church many times, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast not your presence away from me. Take not your Holy Spirit from me. David confessed his sin, and God was able 
to forgive him and put that behind him. You know, not that David escaped the consequences of his actions. He certainly didn't. But God offered him grace. Certainly, the road to falling from grace doesn't for most of us happen quickly. It happens in stages. We don't commit one bad, awful act in one step. It usually comes to us in a series of steps, as it did for David. There is judgment. You know, God is a holy God. God is not mocked. God does not unsee. God is very well aware of the things that we do, and, and judgment stands for us too. But with that also comes mercy and forgiveness and renewal, as it did for David. May we see in this story of David in the whole Bathsheba episode lessons for us to learn about wandering away, lessons about judgment, but also lessons in grace and forgiveness. And may we take those to heart in our own journeys of faith. Amen. Let us continue by turning to hymn number 372, I Then Shall Live. We come now to our moment of worship where we commit our gifts, our tithes, our offerings. Hear these words of instruction as they come to us from the Apostle Paul and 
his letter to the Galatians in chapter 6, verses 9 through 10. And let us not grow weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. So then, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all persons, and especially to those who are of the household of faith. We'll continue now with our response. We give thee but thine own. loving God, we are trying to be more aware of the needs of others and less and less absorbed in our selfish concerns. So we pray that you will sharpen our minds and dedicate our skills to support these offerings which we bring, and we ask for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Announcements and acknowledgments celebrating birthdays this week. Annabelle Wickes, Savannah Johnson, Ruth Miller, Joseph Ausluce, Ava Mahler, Gavin Gebler, and Addison Graney. Celebrating anniversaries this week, Scott and Annette Bunye on this day, and Jay and Peggy Ellis wishing all a happy birthday and happy anniversary. Uh, the rest of the announcements I would commend to your reading and to your consideration. Let us now pray that prayer that Christ our Savior has taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Amen.